Hi, and welcome to this presentation on high-speed imaging from machine vision to event capture from First Vision. In this presentation, we're going to cover several different topics uh, dealing with high-speed imaging using off-the-shelf components to be able to achieve these applications. Uh, we'll go over several different areas here, uh, several of the topics, talk about some of the application areas, uh, evolution of the technology from CCD to CMOS technology, uh, talk about some of the current sensors and what that technology involves, and also look at some considerations. If you are doing high-speed imaging, there are certain things that we need to take into compensation. Um, additional things that we can take a look at is some of the features of the sensors and the cameras themselves that actually help with the speed, and actually look at what's going on in the future in regards to some of the interfaces. The one thing we want to take a look at is types of high-speed camera applications using off-the-shelf components. Uh, we'll take a look at two specific areas here, looking at machine vision and event capture. And machine vision, classic, where we want to actually stop pixel blur on some applications that are going relatively fast, um, maybe to try to do some measurements on those. So example here, car speeding by at relatively fast speed. We can't use 1 60th of a second on, say, a regular camera. We may need to do 1 250th of a second to actually stop that motion. A uh, similar thing in machine vision and imaging uh, with industrial cameras. In addition to that, we need to actually capture many parts per minute. So aside from having a short exposure, we'll actually want to have the repeatability in regards to the rep rep repetition rate of those parts going by. Lastly, we'll look at event capture with actually doing some of the video recording to stop motion. Uh, so example here, looking at a bottle operation, trying to see when those bottles may be breaking and actually do some uh, slow motion videos and be able to analyze that event. So we'll look at machine vision applications first that we really want to talk about stopping pixel blur. So still high speed applications and these types of uh, applications where we might be looking at cigarette pad inspection, mail sortation, maybe reading a 2D code, uh, faster inspection, food packaging to web applications. All these really require it so that we have a certain exposure that's actually going to stop the pixel blur. So this here is a little formula I can share with you in regards to how to calculate that. Um, so formula here, we're looking at this uh, formula for capturing blur in pixels. And we'll want to know some of these things to plug in the formulas. What is the part velocity? What is the field of view and the direction of motion? What is the actual exposure time that we've got the camera set at? And the number of pixels that span across that field of view. Uh, plugging in the formula here, for example, if we look at a part that's moving one centimeter second, uh, time on our camera is about 33 milliseconds. And number of pixels we've got is 640, and say our field of view is 10 centimeters. If we do that math, we'll actually see that we'll have a blur of about 2.1 pixels, which isn't very good. Typically, we want to be at least one pixel or less in regards to have a crisp image. Um, so if we rearrange that formula a little bit, we've got a um, formula here, T uh, for the time with the field of view over um, the part velocity. And the number of pixels that we have can actually tell us uh, the time that we need. So if we do that math, we'll come up with about 15.6 milliseconds and actually be able to get one pixel blur. Uh, many good that vision applications uh, get down to some pixel precision as well, uh, but at least shooting for one pixel is a good place to start here. So again, with this, key things we're going to look at is stopping pixel blur, get a short enough exposure. This is really geared towards fast moving parts. Uh, we'll really do this today with uh, CCD cameras. If we weren't having a very high repetition rate, um, we used to do this in the day plenty of times with CCDs, but CMOS is where it's at today. So if we talk about event capture, is the next one, we can really talk about stopping pixel blur and do some video recording for analysis. So we're really talking about streaming video onto a computer so we can do some analysis of those images thereafter. Uh, pixel blur formula still applies. Maybe a little bit harder to understand some of the speeds. Uh, you have maybe have some armature of some machinery that's moving. Uh, not always uh, easy to figure, try to figure out what that is. So a little trial and error that might be uh, might be needed. And talk about some slight blur blurring may be acceptable. Uh, we're not doing measurement applications here. We're doing event capture to see what has happened within um, a certain motion or a uh, application that's going on. Um, so examples here, maybe doing some event capture on a bottling line. Uh, again, something keeps on breaking. We want to record that scene for some period of time, uh, maybe an hour, two hours, maybe a couple days, uh, try to see what's happening. Maybe some process monitoring, look at a sawmill, uh, maybe look at some blades on an application that's going by and seeing if there's uh, certain things that are occurring. Uh, and doing a lot of analysis on uh, sports. So uh, golf is a big thing that we work with. 
and uh, looking at swing analysis. So example here, we couldn't play this video on here, but here's an example of a few frames that was taken out of an egg dropping. Um, this was actually done with an 800 by 600 resolution uh, using some stream tech software at about 200 frames per second. And we could look at each one of those individual frames and actually see what was occurring uh, within the field of view. So what's changed from where we were about five years ago? Uh, we were really looking at cameras that were not applicable to this, that were off the shelf uh, solutions. Uh, we basically were too slow. We were, had CCD technology that we were using back then. Um, so this has all progressed now into CMOS technology that has provided us the speeds that we're getting today. Um, so just a little history here, if we look at the past to the present, there's been a big technology shift. Um, biggest thing we've seen is within the sensors themselves, going from single tap sensors, which is uh, think about a, a one pipe trying to get that data out, versus Kodak introduced looking at uh, dual tap and quad taps, where we're actually using multiple pipes to actually get the information out. So dual tap might have uh, two pipes coming out to drain uh, the information out versus four and a quad tap. So look what happens here. If we look at some sensors that was uh, good about five or so years ago, ICX424 at about a VGA resolution, 90 frames. Got a little bit better as we progressed along. ICX414, still CCD, 122 frames. We started getting into the Kodaks and we started going into quad taps and dual taps. Uh, we're getting the same thing, VGA 205. And now today, we look at a DALSA camera that's here using an on semi Python sensor. It's a CMOS. We're getting the same resolution at 392 frames. So now we're really into uh, the technology in this day and age that we can actually use off the shelf cameras like this for high speed capture. So, where does this uh, CMOS camera bring us today, right? This, this opens up the door to many, many, many things. Um, for us, the new CMOS sensors uh, really address more applications really due to low cost. Uh, many of the resolutions that we're looking at, even a VGA at relatively high speeds and it can achieve up to 800 frames a second, um, are starting at un under $500. So applications that we really typically needed very high-end, very expensive, high-speed cameras before can really be done with off-the-shelf cameras today. So some examples here of different camera rates available, looking at a couple of the different sensors that are here. Um, so going anywhere from some of the on-semi pythons from VGA, up to 1.2 and 2 megapixel. Obviously, as you go up in resolution, uh, we're still trying to put a certain amount of data down a certain interface, USB 3 in this case. Uh, you can see here that a VGA is going to get us about 550 with a USB camera, USB 3, uh, versus 2 megapixel. Obviously, we're going to go a little bit slower because we still have to put this data down um, the pipe. So we're maybe at 165. Uh, but we can get into other interfaces. We can take a look at 10 gig E Coex Express. Um, those, we'll go over this, is allowing more information to go down and giving you more bandwidth. But just as an example here, if we look at uh, two VGA cameras, one using USB 3 versus Gigi, we can see USB 3 is, is faster here. We have more, uh, more bandwidth, 550 frames versus 392. So depending on the application, we'll talk a little bit about interfaces here in a minute. Uh, we may look at specific interfaces with the image sensors, depending on the frame rates that are needed uh, to achieve the application. A little example to the right over here, process monitoring application. This video is actually on our, on our website uh, where we're looking at a uh, drill bit that's actually rotating at uh, 1,750 RPMs. And with a two megapixel camera using a 10 gig interface, which has a lot of bandwidth, uh, going 338 frames, we could actually record and capture 12 frames per its rotation. Pretty impressive. So again, off-the-shelf solutions here today be able to bring us into high-speed image capture. So what's happened? It's really a big shift in the technology. And why is CMOS faster than what CC is, CCD is today? And it really comes down to the sensor architecture. If on the left-hand side here, we look at a CCD image sensor, each one of these little blocks here representing a pixel, uh, what happens here is that to get us information off the sensor, um, all this information is shifted down. It's like a bucket brigade. And all this information is shifted down off the sensor, uh, pushing it around with the current on the sensor, which takes time. It comes down to the shift register and does a readout. Over here on the right-hand side is the CMOS imager. CMOS imager is actually a voltage device, um, but the pixel readout is actually done at the pixel site itself, uh, voltage-driven, 
So think about the water in the bathtub again. If we would actually pull the drain on each one of those pixels, we can actually drain those pixels very quickly instead of have to try to push all that water, if you will, across the sensor and then down and out. So in turn, the technology from the sensor itself in CMOS is really giving us these gains in regards to additional higher frame rates. So what are some of the other considerations we have here, though? As we start going faster, uh, we start to become light starved, right? So think about a pixel again as a bucket of water. And basically, we're trying to fill up that bucket with some water, which is an electrical charge, and be able to convert that into a grayscale. Um, well, if we think about putting an umbrella over that bucket while it's raining, and we just open that umbrella for a very short period of time, and we let water go into the bucket, uh, we're only going to collect a little bit of water, right? So that water is really our charge, and we're only putting a little bit of a charge. Well, so now if we think about this in terms of incoming light to that sensor, um, we really need a lot of light, we need a lot of rain essentially coming in to help fill up that bucket within that short period of time. So we need to really look at lighting considerations in this, and it becomes uh, very challenging in some cases the shorter exposures you go. So instance here, if we go 800 frames a second in an application, we only have 1.25 milliseconds of exposure. Not a lot of time to collect that light. Um, so we need to take a look at that as well, especially when you start going high speed. Um, take a look at your sensors. Um, you can get information in regards to quantum efficiencies, uh, performance in regards to dynamic range, what is its low light performance. A lot of times we'll look at absolute uh, sensitivity thresholds within sensors themselves, and we can help you with that. We can help share some of this information with you to help make some logical decisions on which sensor is best for the applications, especially with high speed. Bandwidth interface considerations, right? This is big. This is really comes tying together to the amount of data that you have coming down the pipe. So we have resolution by a certain bit depth, say eight bits uh, by a frame rate. This is gonna tell us how much information we really have coming down. So in a case here, we have a 1.2 megapixel camera, 1280 by 1024, running at 224 frames at eight bits. We do some of our math here. We figure out that we're gonna actually get about 280 megabytes per second coming down. Um, so that information really has to go down through an interface and then over to the computer. And so we'll look at, for a given sensor, uh, what interface will actually be used to get specific speeds. So these are some common interfaces down, that are down below here. We have Gigi, uh, USB 3, uh, Camera Link, and Coax Express. Each one, as we go from left to right here, has a larger bandwidth. So as we use maybe the same sensor, uh, we can actually get higher speeds out of that. Um, so example on the right here, if I look at Gigi versus USB 3, using an on-semi sensor, we can see that with Gigi, I'm getting 51 frames here, while USB 3, I'm getting 165 frames. So obviously more bandwidth is being allowed with USB 3, which allows us to have much higher frame rate. Um, other considerations here to take into account is cable types. Um, that we're going to be using for these types of interfaces. And I think more importantly is really looking at cable lengths. So if you have an application, we're going to be doing something relatively high speed. Uh, USB 3 with standard cables can go 5 meters versus Gig E being 100 meters. Um, Camera Link, 10 meters. Coax Express can actually go pretty far. Um, but it be noted, though, that Camera Link and Coax Express are relatively more difficult uh, cameras to set up, a little bit more complexity versus Gigi and USB really being plug and play in a lot of cases. So some other considerations to look at there. <clears throat> if we look at system architecture, some considerations there. In all cases, we have a PC, but the specs on that PC are really going to be um, factors in regarding your application, either doing machine vision or event capture. If you're, doing a, if you're doing a more of a machine vision application, do you have algorithms that are process intensive, uh, doing a variety of computations that are on there? Um, so that will really dictate what your processor is. Uh, memory, the number of ports we're using, the number of storage we've got, um, and the bus that we may need in regards to some of the NIC cards that may be needed uh, are all considerations and really specs vary per application. Um, if we get into looking at the different interfaces, there are some considerations we need for each. So for USB 3, for instance, we might uh, definitely need to put, put a NIC card in there that will uh, have the right drivers in regards to getting the information uh, off the camera and into your PC. 
Um, so we typically will recommend a NIC card with a Renaissance driver, uh, independent host ports for multi-port applications. Um, so if you are going relatively high speed, a regular port off your PC is not typically going to allow you to get your full bandwidth. Um, we really need to look at a good NIC card. Cables, as important. Uh, USB 3 cables. We don't want to buy ones for Amazon for $5. We really want to look at good quality cables that were designed for machine vision applications. Um, we can also take a look at going longer. As a note here, uh, 5 meters is a limitation on standard USB cables. However, we can go much longer, up to 50 meters with hybrid optical cables. Giggy's in the same boat in regards to a NIC card. Uh, biggest thing we want to look at here is probably using a NIC card with an Intel Pro 1000 driver. Uh, the big thing is, is to try to have the, dri the right drivers that are used to have the camera data coming off and not uh, being taxed by your, pro not taxing your processor, but helping go in the right direction. Um, so the NIC cards will help you do that and actually get the frame rates that you desire. Cables as important here, uh, Cat 5e, Cat 6 cables are a must. Uh, using anything lower than that, um, you have uh, noise issues that could come into play, which could cause some drop frames, and in turn not get all the data that you're looking for to the PC. Higher-end interfaces here, Camerlink, Coax Express, all require frame grabbers, all require dedicated quality cables. Again, Camerlink, Coax Express, a little bit more uh, difficult for implementation versus USB and GIGI. Peripherals. Keep this in mind as well as we think about all the pieces and building blocks that go together uh, to build up a system for doing high-speed imaging. Um, we need to look at lensing for this so we can get the field of views that we need. Uh, lighting, as we discussed, is very important, and mounts, etc. So off-the-shelf components can be used today, again, to start to make up some high-speed imaging systems. Taking a look at the camera and the lens as a building block, down to the cables, to the NIC card, to the PC, all bits and pieces here that are very important. And again, um, very important to make sure that these right components are picked because uh, it could be a weak link in the system, such as a NIC card, that could cause you issues. Hardware and software considerations. We need to really think about this as this is a machine vision application and, or again, high-speed event capture. Um, so hardware considerations, as we talked just a bit ago, talking about the processor, uh, is it uh, computational intensive? So we may need to look at a PC that is a little bit higher end versus if we're just doing event capture um, and just streaming the information off, um, maybe a different consideration there. But again, application dependent here, but we need to think about um, those specific things from the processor and functionality. Camera interface, do we need a PC that has the right slots to maybe put in a frame grabber, right number of lanes that we need for that grabber, um, or can we use a industrial PC like we see over the right here that maybe have multiple ports for GIGI, multiple ports for USB 3. Um, so different considerations there. And disk space, uh, really more specific to event capture. This really determines, is determined by the time frame that you want to record in. So if we were to record for a certain time, we're really looking at the number of pixels we've got, the frame rate we're going to be running at, and the bit depth. Um, doing a little math here, we can identify what is the total number of megabytes per second that we're going to get out of that. And then we can take a look at how much space we're really going to need if we're going to record two hours versus two days. Uh, it's going to be a major consideration for the drive we're going to pick. And then in addition to the drive, we can start looking at the drives themselves and decide do we want to get a solid state versus a conventional drive. Uh, solid state drives will basically have very high write speeds and be very consistent through the right of the entire disk. Uh, versus conventional drives, conventional drives will have some variation as you start writing from the outside versus the inside of the disk and not be quite as consistent. Software considerations, many to look at today. Um, if we just want to do some recording, a uh, nice software package to use is from uh, Norpix called StreamPix. And you can basically have a uh, digital recording software here that can plug into Giggy, USB cameras, CameraLink cameras, Coax Express, many different cameras, variety of different resolutions, all to do uh, recording onto your PC. Quite a bit out there in regards to sports analytics. Uh, golf swing is a big one that we work with, pitch mechanics, etc. Um, there's independent companies that really do these types of software to help pair together the cameras. But again, a lot of these are off-the-shelf cameras to be able to do these types of applications for relatively high speed. 
and there's many post-processing analytical software such as National Instruments. So we might record a uh, shorter session of time, take a look at those frames and actually do some analysis on there. Um, or classic machine vision, right? Looking at Cognix uh, software packages that are out there, Matrox, National Instruments has some, um, all looking at uh, doing some type of analysis on the images at relatively high speeds as well. So a couple features here to really help with the speed on standard CMOS cameras. Um, two things, really looking at the sensor features and the camera's features. On the sensor's features, we hit, can always do partial scan. So basically what this is, is windowing down your field of view, as we see to the right here, and actually setting the region of interest, which is this red box that's here. So vertical offset, we define a height. We may say that we're only capturing a certain height of lines here, which basically speeds up the overall frame rate. Uh, one thing to note is that in some sensors, and specifically on, on semi-sensors, doing a region of interest and not capturing the information to the left and the right here of, the re of this region of interest actually helps speed up the sensor. This was unlike CCD and it's unlike some other CMOS sensors. So on semis typically can go a little bit faster uh, than some of the other sensors uh, that are out there from, say, Sony. <clears throat> camera features is another one to take a look at. Uh, many cameras today uh, looking to see if they have onboard memory, such as some of the IDS cameras, essentially help with some of the traffic control that's there. Um, IDS also has some things where you can play with the pixel clock and speed the pixel clock and be able to uh, boost the frame rate over some other uh, cameras as well. Uh, versus uh, Teledyne Dalsa. Teledyne Dalsa uses a very interesting technique called Turbo Drive. And this is uh, working with the image entropy that it has. And we won't go uh, deep into this now, but basically it's allowing you to take pixels that are all of the same values and group them together and transfer that little bit of information versus transferring every uh, bit of pixel information. So what it typically does is we'll speed up uh, past some of the giggy rates and actually help lower some of the bandwidth um, so we can go faster. We'll have some examples here in a minute. So some examples in partial scan. So if we look to the right here, here's uh, vertical lines um, and here's some of the frame rates we can get. So as you can see, as we start to reduce some of that vertical um, height in the image, we can actually run faster. So if we look at a 1920 by 1216 full frame, we're only going 83 frames. If we window that down to VGA and go 640 by 480, uh, we're about 200 frames. So we've uh, jumped up quite a bit in regards to the frame rate. So the pro is, is that we can get faster frame rates. The con is, is that you have somewhat reduced resolution. Um, again, some other features here more specific to IDS, USB 3, we can do things with the extended pixel clock, additional memory as well, and some of those uh, specific features that can be worked under the sensor uh, will help increase the speed. Turbo Drive, again, a little example here using some image entropy with GIGI interfaces. Example here, if we look at a uh, DALSA Nano M800, it's an 800 by 600 sensor, typically going at about 255 frames. If we turn Turbo Drive on, uh, we can see frame rates up to 566 frames. So pretty quick. And you can actually see here, here's an example with Turbo Drive on, even on VGA 640 by 480, uh, we can actually achieve 862 frames relatively quick. So what's on the horizon? Many things have changed. CCD is being taken over by CMOS. Uh, the technology is there within CMOS to do relatively high speed. What's interesting is that a lot of the sensors today are somewhat limited due to the bandwidth. Um, so you might have a sensor from on semi that can go relatively fast rates, over 100 frames from the sensor itself. However, your bandwidth limited. So maybe in a USB 3 camera, you're only going to get, say, 72 or 80 frames out of that uh, versus looking at other interfaces. So some of the other interfaces that are coming are actually allow us to do even more data than what we're getting today. Uh, and a couple of them here, uh, talking about Thunderbolt uh, 2, which has been out, getting about 20 gigabits per second. Uh, Thunderbolt 3, as of uh, today in September of 2016, is going to be coming soon uh, with about 30 gigabits per second. Uh, Nbase T is actually on the horizon as well. This is actually a technology that is going to use existing Ethernet cables. Uh, will allow you to get 5 gigabits per second. And USB 3.1. Uh, the second generation of USB 3.1 will get 10 gigabits per second. 
little different style connectors than we used to with the type of C connector that's on there that will go to the cameras, uh, but getting relatively higher frame rates. So these new technologies will actually allow us to see even faster frame rates than what we're getting today out of the current sensors. So in summary, we're looking at really a technology shift here. We're opening up more and more applications with some of the CMOS technology, with the new interfaces that are coming, uh, really enabling higher speed rates that we weren't able to achieve before, uh, far past 500 frames uh, with a given resolution and the correct interface. Um, and really coming down in price. So the CMOS sensors have come down to be reasonable. Even five megapixel sensors, uh, which used to be in the $2,500 range, are now under $1,000. Um, so you can start to build up some of your own high-speed applications and look at machine vision applications that you typically couldn't before with some of the new technology. And third-party software available for all this, um, from machine vision to event capture, depending on what you're looking to do. Um, there's some software out there that will tie together with the interfaces and work together with the cameras. So today you can actually look at building some of your own systems with these off-the-shelf components in probably the three to $5,000 range including software and computers and the hardware for the cameras. Um, so we can do quite a lot today without having to do, go to uh, very expensive high-end cameras. So that is, includes a short presentation here talking about uh, high-speed technology and how it's really come uh, to us today with the various interfaces, with the newer sensors that are there, and really starting to open up the doors. Thanks for listening.